What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to the Neighborhood Podcast. I'm your host of the podcast. My name is Kyle Dabra. What's going on, everybody? Kevin Valentin here. Back at it again with my boy Kyle. Happy Wednesday, bro. Yes, sir. I see that somebody finally got his voice back after like the last three days. Bro, you got to hit me with a stoma voice just because that's what your voice sounded like the last couple of days. Guys, I don't know if y'all remember or if y'all even old enough. There was a there were commercials back when we were growing up about people smoking cigarettes and you know trying to get them to stop. And they would show like the people that had the holes in their throats. My voice sounded that bad, and I don't know what it's from. I got medication now, so I'm good. But I was battling a cold for a good week or so, and I don't know if you guys remember last week. Uh, the audio was pretty shot because I kept having to clear my throat, but. We are back, and I am good to go. I'm about 85%. You're probably going to hear me clear my throat a couple times, but I'm just happy I'm able to talk because, man, Kyle, when I told Kyle I had no voice, I know he was like, who the hell is this guy on the phone? Well, at least he got no more stoma <clears throat> voice. You know, as long as you got that, as long as you got your voice back, that's all that matters to me because, you know what, uh, it makes the podcast better. So <laughs> I don't know why. Sometimes, like, when, when I do my stoma voice, it, it kind of brings out the Boston in me a little bit. I'm not from Boston, but... It kind of brings that New England accent out because I'll start, I'll start kind of adding a h's to the end of every word. So that's just kind of how I see it. But you're a pain in the ass. Oh, I know. But dude, that's my job. My job is supposed to. Uh, if I'm not irritating you, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. My job is just to do that all the time. Ridiculous. But, but with that said, bro, we got some topics to go over. You ready to dive into this? Oh yeah. <laughs> prime example exactly it's probably gonna happen a couple more times we'll just kind of take it as we go um but like kevin said we got a couple topics to knock out um most of these are going to revolve around the nba i will have some we'll have one mlb topic we'll have an nfl topic and then we're going to round up the episode with a movie review uh the new dr strange movie is out uh dr strange the multiverse of madness or the madness of the multiverse whatever the work it's called multiverse of madness sir okay listen it's a big title so work with me on that one so it it's a big title but overall um that'll be fun to go over um we haven't done a movie review in a little bit and this is probably one of the biggest movies that's come out within the last couple of months or so and this will definitely be a fun topic of discussion when we get there um but we're just going to dive into the first topic. I'm not going to give any sort of lead up to what we have on deck. Uh, we're just going to dive straight into our first topic. And that is going to be the ongoing beef between Rudy Gobert and Shaquille O'Neal. So if you guys haven't heard at this point in time, uh, Rudy Gobert and Sha Shaquille O'Neal have been going back and forth on social media. Just throwing social media jabs at one another. Essentially what all of this started from was... Shaq was on his podcast last week and they were talking about Rudy Gobert. Somebody had mentioned um, in regards to Shaq about Rudy Gobert. And basically this person was saying, I think it was Anthony Adams on Shaq's podcast was saying that Rudy Gobert would hold Shaquille O'Neal to 12 points. And then Shaq responded within the first three minutes, just insinuating that, that Rudy couldn't guard him. And then Rudy responded by saying that he would essentially lock up Shaq defensively. I think the correct quote is that he thought that he would lock his ass up. And then after that, it's really just kind of been one verbal jab back and forth at one another. But it really kind of stems from this uh, podcast episode that Shaq had last week where Rudy Gobert's name got brought up in the discussion. So now that we have that set, Kevin, to kick this one to you, with the ongoing beef that's between Shaquille O'Neal and Rudy Gobert, who do you think is the winner and loser from this beef at this point? I know winners and losers, man. We're talking about one of the greatest basketball players of all time. We're talking about the most dominant offensive player the game has ever seen. We're talking about a guy that for a three or four year stretch was the most powerful strongest largest impactful player in the league from like 99 to 2004 we're talking about a guy that played in an era of some of the greatest big men in nba history including 
Dikembe Mutombo, uh, Chris Webber, Tim Duncan, David Robinson, uh, Alonzo Mourning, and, and the list just really goes on. We're talking about actual physical centers. We're talking about when you can actually foul people and it wouldn't be called. We're talking about a guy that dominated the NBA pretty much from his birth of you know when he was drafted to probably around the time of the end of his Miami days. And you're going to talk about Rudy Gobert? Rudy Gobert got dunked on by Spencer Dinwiddie last round. Rudy Gobert is a guy that sits here and and, and makes jokes and puns uh, about certain people and how they play. Rudy Gobert is currently trying to make an organization choose, similar to Shaq, I'll give him that, Uh, you know, him or Donovan Mitchell, and where Shaq kind of had to make that call about him or Kobe back in the day. But one of them is an NBA top 75 player of all time. One of them has four championships. One of them has multiple MVPs. One of them has defensive player of the years, all pros, defensive all pros. And the other one has a couple of defensive player of the year awards. It's it's not close. I mean, you're telling me is Rudy Gobert better than, than David Robinson? Are you telling me that Rudy Gobert is better than Alonzo Mourning? Uh, I can't see that. I, 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 are you telling me he's even better than Dikembe Mutombo? And Dikembe is not even known for offense. We're just talking about straight up defending bigs. There's not a chance on the earth that Shaq doesn't give him a minimum of 50. If we're including today's era of fouls, Rudy's getting fouled out within the first half. It's not even a question. It, it, Shaq is the most physically dominating individual. And since this is a hypothetical, we can just we can pick a time frame to where Shaq actually goes out there and beats his ass. We can do Orlando Shaq. We can do Miami Shaq. We can even do Phoenix Shaq, where he was literally clearly had lost a step. I would still give the edge to Shaq. It's a one dribble turnaround. Take your two steps, and you're dunking right on Rudy Gobert. It's not even close. Shaq was a 300 pound, seven foot two monster that, within the area of the paint, was his domain. There was never a question. I don't know where he thinks he's going to get a clean block like Shaq is going to go for the sky hook like Kareem or, 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 or a fadeaway off the block. Shaq's literally going to put the ball down. He's going to put his shoulder in your chest. And he's going to eat you alive. I don't understand why this is even a thought, a question, a debate. It's, it's comical. Rudy Gobert can't score more than 15 points in a playoff game when his team is in jeopardy of losing. And he is regarded as one of the biggest liabilities in that series because we went small, and by we, I mean Dallas. The offense ran through Shaq on every team he was ever on, even when he was playing with Dwayne, even when he played with Kobe. Granted, those superstars had their opportunities to do their own things as well, but the offense fed through Shaq, and when Shaq was doubled, he would kick out. It's not, it's not close. Shaq by 100, no questions. Yeah, but I mean, the way that I see this, this whole, I guess you would call it beef at this point, just the verbal shots have been thrown back and forth between Gobert and Shaq. Honestly, I just kind of find it amusing because Rudy's making this point that he would essentially lock up Shaq. Like, like he's basically saying that he would essentially put himself up as like one of the greatest defenders as far as defending bigs in NBA history. And I just find that absolutely comical because I mean, Kevin, we're old enough to remember Shaq. Shaq was the most dominating force that we've ever seen in the NBA. Granted, we don't consider him as the greatest basketball player that's ever played in NBA history. That belongs to Michael Jordan. I don't want to hear anybody say anything about LeBron James. It is Michael Jordan. But when it comes to just an individual that just, took over a game and as far as just taking it over just being a dominating force the NBA will never see someone like Shaq as far as just dominating the game it's never going to happen again and essentially you know I don't know where Rudy's really kind of getting this thought process from I mean don't get me wrong Rudy Gobert is what I would consider a, a solid NBA player by modern standards and I mean, I have to kind of give him a little bit of credit just based off of what he, he's done in his career. I mean, he's pretty much a finalist pretty much every year or every other year when it comes to NBA Defensive Player of the Year. So it's not like, I'm not going to sit here and say that Rudy Gobert is just dog water or he's trash at basketball. He's not. Defensively, he's pretty solid. 
and on the offensive side of the ball, yeah, his game is lacking um, compared to what Shaq did. But when it comes to this one-on-one matchup between Rudy Gobert and Shaquille O'Neal, it's literally just comical. I mean, you could go through Shaq's entire career, like Kevin just mentioned, where you, it doesn't matter whether it was Orlando, uh, the Lakers, Miami, and even Phoenix, Shaq dominated. Every aspect of the game on those respective teams, maybe Phoenix is the one where you would kind of, you know, maybe pull that back a little bit, but nobody found a way to stop him outside of just fouling him. That's where the whole hack a shack method came from because he dominated the paint unlike anybody that's played that position before. Shaq would go out there and average 30 by just utterly dominating the opposing center he was going up against. And he went up against all-time great defenders. He went up against David Robinson, Butumbo, and there were other great defenders that he went up in his time, and he literally knocked them over like bowling pins. Shaq, like Kevin said, he's 7'2". He weighed over 300 pounds, and nobody could really find any sort of effective way to slow him down. It didn't even matter if he, if he was being double-teamed or sometimes even triple-teamed. His physical presence that he brought to the game of basketball is probably one of the most astounding things I've ever seen when it comes to just a center in the NBA. Because by and large, nobody's really been able to replicate that type of physical domination at the center position like him. There have been great NBA centers that have come and gone. But when it comes to Shaq specifically, this one-on-one matchup between him and Rudy, Rudy would get cooked. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful to, to Rudy. Rudy is an NBA basketball player, and that deserves respect just by itself. But this matchup would literally be a walking mismatch. I mean, Shaq would probably average 35 to 40 points in this matchup. And like Kevin said, if they ever even got into a situation where they actually played one-on-one in a real game where both of them are in their prime, Rudy would probably be out of the game within the first 15 minutes of the game as Shaq would just literally make it a point of emphasis to just essentially abuse him down low and essentially just dunk on him once he would get you know the right position on the offensive side of the ball this whole debate it all started because Shaq went on his podcast somebody had mentioned uh, that Rudy Gobert would do a decent job defending him holding him to I think the quote was holding him to 12 points And Shaq responded by saying, yeah, in the first three minutes. And as far as I'm concerned, Shaq wasn't lying. He was truthful. He was honest in that regard. And Rudy just saying that he would lock his ass up. (laughs) I don't think Rudy understands the level of physicality that Shaq brought to the game. I mean, he went up against bigs, you know, 6'10", 6'11", 7-footers, and literally made it like, a walk in the park to go up against them. I mean, Shaq, for God's sakes, I think in, in playoff series, he would average at least 30 to 35 points a game and get at least 10 to 15 rebounds. And not only that, get some blocks and steals on top of that. Shaq is one of, like, you could basically say he's like a top 10 player of all time. And Rudy Gobert is nowhere near that. For God's sakes, I don't even think Rudy Gobert is in that, that top 75 NBA players list that they came out with earlier this year. He's, he's nowhere even close to that. So with Rudy Gobert making all these comments that he would lock his ass up, good luck. This would be a one-sided affair. And to be quite honest with you, it would just be comical. So this whole thing when it comes to Rudy Gobert, I find it comical and and Shaq would just destroy him. It's as simple as that. Now, I know there's another narrative that people are trying to give credit. And I I mean, to an extent, I will give him some credit. At least he stood up for himself. It would be a completely different narrative. He was like, yeah, you're right, big bro. Like, you would absolutely crush me. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's it's one thing to kind of, you know, bet on yourself and, and be confident in what you would do, especially as a center. <clears throat> and there's another thing of just being flat out stupid. I would lock your ass up. It, it, it's how you articulate and how you word it. If you were to be like, nah, bro, I think you cap in. Like, you know, like, I'd give you a bigger challenge than you think. Or like, bro, let's play right now. Something entertaining for you to go out there and say, I'd lock your ass. I just... 
like I said, I give him credit for at least defending himself and, and you know having a little bit of confidence and some faith. But hey, it, that faith is a little misguided. Misguided. I think it's <clears throat> not even worth it. It's not even. Don't even try it. I mean, Shaq is a top ten player of all time. Rudy Gobert is nowhere even near that. I, I just find this whole conversation, this whole topic to just be hysterical. Because I think even Shaq made a comment the other day. He said something like, I wonder what French barbecue chicken tastes like. It's hilarious. I'm mean, like, it would be, it'd just be a walk in the park for Shaq. It's as simple as that. And honestly, I don't even think there's really much else that we could talk about it. Other than just... There isn't. I, I mean, one-on-one. If you were playing a game to 21, just, just 21, if Shaq got the ball first, is Rudy even getting the ball back? I don't think so, honestly. Probably not. I mean, you're, you're, those are all highly efficient inside the paint shots. And I mean, like, depending on what kind of one-on-one you're playing, are we talking, like, officiated? Are we talking about street? Are we talking about organized basketball? Like, I well, don't know. In, in a game of 21, <clears throat> you know, it would, it would essentially just be a, a, a street version. But when it comes to an actual game, you know, 48 minutes, four quarters, you know, and if they were in a situation where it's, you know, center versus center, Shaq's going to give him 40. Yeah. Sha- and with sure. the right, and with the right motivation, Shaq would probably give him 50. Agreed. And, I mean, like I said, there's, there's not really much else that we could kind of talk about with this one. It, it's easy. It's an easy one. Time to move on. Now we get to talk about your team, Kev. And I know that, I know you're not feeling yourself. You're not, you know, you're not really feeling that great about the Mavs after that game five debacle that took place in Phoenix. Um, and that'll be the, the next topic of our conversation. So um, to dive into this Mavericks and Suns series, just to kind of give a quick summary of where we stand. Uh, the Suns are currently up 3-2 in the series against the Dallas Mavericks. Um, in game five, it was a dominated performance from Phoenix. Uh, they won by the score of 110-80. to uh, Really in the second half, Phoenix made great adjustments to essentially beat the brakes off of Dallas in the second half, because in the first half, Mavericks were, were in it with Phoenix. It was only a three-point uh, lead for Phoenix going into halftime, and that third quarter by Phoenix was phenomenal. Point thirty-three points to Dallas is fourteen, and then Phoenix did not let up in the fourth quarter, having another efficient quarter to end the game. And as it stands right now, the, the series goes back to Dallas for Game Six. Uh, Dallas has won all of their home games in this series. Uh, There hasn't been a road win by any team in this series so far. So this game six is pivotal for both teams. Uh, Phoenix would advance to the Western Conference Finals if they win game six. And if Dallas were to win, this would take this series to seven games. And game seven would take place in Phoenix to wrap up the series. Now, to focus on the Mavericks specifically, Kevin, we're talking about your team. Diehard Mavs fan. Kev, I got to ask you, when it comes to Dallas in this series, do you think that Luka Doncic is actually holding the Mavericks back as a whole in this series against the Suns? Before, before you even put the camera on me, put it back on us, because I, w- I, want, I, want I want everybody to see your reactions too. In your lifetime, <clears throat> we've lived through Kobe, we've lived through Braun, we've lived through KD, Kyrie, all these mega stars that love taking all these crazy shots. In what world do those superstars shoot as inefficiently as Luka Doncic has been the last couple of games and keep shooting? Kobe. Kobe would. But the Lakers find ways to win games. The Lakers had teammates around them. I'm just talking about straight superstars. The angle I'm getting at is Luka Doncic is a generational player. Luka Doncic is a top three, top five NBA player depending on who you ask. The Mavericks are as successful recently because Luka Doncic has been able to carry them through. Despite the first two games that he missed in the Utah series, we were still able to split that. um, Or the first three games, excuse me. Uh, We were able to uh, go up 2-1. Excuse me. Now, of course, now as I'm going to speak, now my throat wants to start acting up. Luka Doncic last night, there were several instances where he pulled with 19, 18 seconds on the shot clock. Not moving the ball. Isolation basketball. Got a mismatch on Aiton. Got a mismatch on McGee or Biombo, And he decided to pull. Luka was 2 of 8 from the three-point line. 
Luka is two of, I believe, 18 or four of 18 from the three-point line in the last two games. Luka Doncic scored 28 points last night, but he took 23 shots. Jalen Brunson, 9 of 17. He had 21 points. The both of them had four turnovers a pop. The Mavericks as a whole just stopped attacking the basket. They got too reliant on shooting the three ball because after game four, we thought, hey, we can do this all game. We can do this every week. We can do this every fucking se- every series. No, we went 8 of 32 from the three-point line. We shot 25%. From the free throw line, we shot 66%. From the field, we shot 38 fucking percent. Guys, do you realize how embarrassing that is? Do you have any idea how watching this game made me lose brain cells? Can we fucking get it together and act like the basketball team we are at home? Can we figure out that maybe when we get Aiton, McGee, and and Biombo in foul trouble, we can continue to attack the paint and live off of the free throw line? They're going to start collapsing on the paint, and you're going to kick it out to shooters. We're not going to do these isolation at the top of the key, get a mismatch and keep pulling. We're not going to keep doing this isolation, pull off off the elbow. We're not going to keep doing this swing the ball around until someone's open in the corner. No. We need to run set plays. We need to attack the basket, get to the free throw line, and create for other people. But when Luca's on the floor, it's like no holds barred. It's just, fuck it, give me the ball. I'm going to just put it up there. Our bigs, absolutely atrocious. Maxi Kleeb was out here basically playing with one eye, black eye. I'm completely being exaggerative just for my girlfriend purposes because she loves him. That's her favorite player on the team. Um, obviously, Dwight Powell's a complete liability. Boban's not going to get any burn because he's completely useless. And even when you put in Marcus Chris, he's out here trying to fight somebody at the end of the game. Granted, I justify what he did because what Biombo did trying to dunk the ball up 30 with literally like a second to go is trash. And how it escalated was neither here nor there, but still. Um, Spencer Dinwiddie not performing. Three points last night, 16 minutes. You didn't make a basket. All your shots came from the free throw line. What? What are we doing? Explain to me how we lose by 30 after just dominating Phoenix the last two games. Explain to me why we stopped attacking the basket and got so shot heavy. Explain to me why Luka Doncic starts the game off, I believe, about like, I want to say four of six, four of seven. Good start. I think 11 or 12 first quarter points. And after that, he just thought, I'm going to just go for 50 tonight. Fuck it. Even if I'm not making it. 10 of 23. If I've always, and I, that, this could be because I'm old fashioned, but if your shot ain't falling, you got to get other people involved. We know that Luka Doncic is a triple double machine, but Dorian Finney Smith was two of three from the three point line to start the game. Do you know what he ended with? Eight points. After he missed that third three, he barely touched the basketball again in the, in the first half. Reggie Bullock. Had zero points. One of our most consistent three-ball shooters this series. Dwight Powell, zero points. Maxi Kleba, four points. Our three and D shooters had a total of 12 points because we got so shot heavy. I'm not going to keep dwelling on it because I'm just getting more and more upset. But Kyle and I have talked about this all season long, all post-series long. When Luka is on the court, sometimes he is more of a hindrance than a blessing because he gets too shot heavy and he thinks that he's got to consistently have these heat check moments and the offense is stagnant. It is Luka by himself with whoever's in front of him. They might get a pick to get a switch and then that's it. That ball's going up. He has been able to dominate and score at a high and efficient clip because he's not necessarily someone that can be guarded by anybody that's on Phoenix's roster. But efficiency-wise, like we talked about with Drew Holiday, it's not always the greatest. I think the other night he was 9 of 25. 10 of 23, is, is that really much better? I can't give him passes because he's Luka Doncic. I can't give him excuses or make excuses for him because he's our best player. If you're our best player and you're getting that double team or your shot's not falling, you got to get everybody else involved. You got to stop driving to the basket, kicking it out. There were a couple of instances where he's already in the paint and he all he has to do is just jump low floater. Instead, he's passing it back out to someone that's already covered. If you're in the paint, take the shot. Don't take the shot 25 feet from the basket because you think that you can make every step back shot that you've ever taken in your life. So 
I've had about enough. Truthfully and honestly, I think the series ends tomorrow night in, in Dallas. I think that Dallas is going to continue to try to shoot themselves out of the slump. Granted, it, we're at home, so if we win, I'm not going to be surprised. But it's just prolonging us getting ass-whooped in Phoenix again because we just don't know how to play on the road. Luke is a great player. He's a phenomenal player to watch. I've seen him live multiple times. He puts on a show every time. But he just gets too full of himself in too many situations to where it, 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 it infuriates me to watch. And my girlfriend's father, shout out to my girl's pops, he doesn't necessarily watch basketball. He watched the majority of that game with me at his house yesterday. And even he was confused as to what the hell Luca was doing. He's not even a Mavericks fan. He's a Sixers fan. And we'll get into that game in a minute. But when a neutral party that doesn't even watch your games is just as confused as the person that watches almost every game, if not every postseason game, there's got to be a fucking problem here. I'm not saying bench Luca. I'm not saying take shots away from Luca. But you got to pick your poison and you got to know when a shot is good and, you know, when it takes some. Situational awareness. It's applicable in all sports. I just think Luca needs to chill, bro. And if he doesn't, we about to get smoked off our own home floor. Well, and this is one of the things that you and I were talking about. Um, not well, when we were recording. We talked about this the other day. And the one thing that has always kind of concerned me about Luca's game is that when he's on the court, there's no ball movement whatsoever when he's actually the ball handling player. Everybody will space the floor. Everybody will kind of go to their respective spots and they'll just kind of let Luca work his magic. He'll dribble. He'll have a couple crossover moves, try to get some space and then try to get a step back three or a step back jumper. And then that's it. That's the possession or it's either that or he'll pass it to somebody. They'll just kind of pass it around the three point line and, and just hope for a three point shot to get knocked down. And the way that I see the offense being run, it's just stagnant. And to me, this is where Jason Kidd has to make an adjustment. He has to make the adjustment when it comes to how the ball is distributed when Luka is the ball handling player on the offensive side of the ball. Because the way that this offense runs when Luka's running the show, it's inefficient. And they're relying too much on Luka to actually carry the Mavs moving forward. And Kev, we've even talked about this when it comes to um, Jalen Brunson uh, being the ball handling player on the offensive side of the ball. When Jalen is on the offensive side of the ball, it just seems like the ball movement with whoever's on the court with him is just more fluid. It's more efficient. And honestly, I think Dallas gets better shot looks or just gets better opportunities to knock down shots when Jalen's running the show. I can't really say that with Luka. Granted, Luka will go out there and score 25, 30, Sometimes they'll even put up a 40 piece. But it really kind of comes down to at what cost. He might put up 25, 30 shots. He'll knock down 14 or 15 of them. But there are just some possessions you're going to look at. It's like he's doing way too much. He's doing more to actually hurt the Mavs than actually try to help them. And this is kind of one of the things that I think Luka is learning on the fly. Because I think the one thing that when we look at Luka Doncic, Luca's relatively young. He's under 25 years old. He's only been in the league for a couple years. And this series has really shown me when Dallas is not hitting their shots, they are getting smoked. Because in all of their road games where they've gone cold as a unit, and specifically Luca has gone cold, they get destroyed. I mean, in game five, in that third quarter, granted, in game five, they were down three points at halftime. They gave up 33 points to Phoenix in the third quarter alone. Dow scored 14 points. 14. It was a 19-point differential between both teams. And essentially, the game's over. You went from a three-point deficit to a 22-point deficit in the third quarter. You're not going to win basketball games like that. And the one thing that the Mavericks haven't been able to do is to be a good second half team on the road. Because when you look back at some of these road games in Phoenix from, from Dallas's perspective, they're in it in the first half. Now, maybe there was, I think game one was the only game where they actually kind of struggled in the, in the first half. But by and large, in the second half of these games on the road in Phoenix, they have struggled mightily. And when Phoenix goes on a run, Dallas tries to match it when it comes to just going shot for shot against Phoenix, except 
Dallas isn't knocking down their shots, and Phoenix is just getting ample opportunities to knock down shots, whether it's Devin Booker, Chris Paul, DeAndre Ayton, and the list goes on. So, you know, when it comes to the Mavs going into game six, Luka has to be better at ball distribution. Not everything could go through him when he's the ball handling player on the offensive side for them. He has to get Spencer Dinwiddie involved. Spencer's been basically absent this entire series. Uh, Davis Bertans, he's got to get better looks. Um, Dorian Finney-Smith, uh, Reggie Bullock. I mean, these are guys, when given ample opportunities to knock down shots, they can do it. They proved that against the Jazz in the first round of the playoffs. In this series, it's been very spotty. Granted, they were fine uh, in games three and four when they were at home, but they have to show me that they could actually win a road game against Phoenix. And up until this point, based on really their second half performances on the road, I have no reason to believe that they're going to win any of these road opportunities anytime soon in the playoffs just because they're just not built for it yet. Granted, they're still a relatively young team. Luka is still kind of learning things on the fly when it comes to playoff basketball. And this just may be one of those experiences and one of those situations where Luka's going to learn some hard lessons from this series. And granted, when it comes to game six, I still think that Dallas has a shot to win this game. I picked the Suns to win in six. That's kind of how I've seen this series uh, play out. That was my original prediction. And up until this point, everything that I've predicted actually happened. Dallas won both of their home games after Phoenix won their first two. I thought that Phoenix would win uh, game five at home. But, you know, when it comes to game six, my original prediction was that Phoenix would close this out in six. And if if the Mavs play anything like they did on the road in game five going into game six, you can pretty much chalk this up as a dub for Phoenix and Phoenix would go on to the Western Conference Finals. I mean, this is a huge game for both teams. It's do or die for the Mavs. Luka's got to be better because you can make a very legitimate point that he's actually holding the Mavericks back to a certain extent with how he's playing on the offensive side of the ball. And if that's not corrected, um, Dallas is going to be out of the playoffs. That's just how I see it. Check this number out, right? Luca and Jalen, 40 shots between the two of them. We shot the ball 71 times. That's more than 50% mm-hmm. as a team. They took that many shots. Our, our 3 and D, our magical three players, which is Dorian Finney-Smith, Maxi Kleba, and Reggie Bullock, in terms of their high percentages and their shot volume and their defense. Dorian shot the ball six times. Reggie shot it five times. Maxi shot it five times. 16 times between three players. Jalen had more than that by himself. This is our issue. When we're home, ball movement is fluid. When we're home, the ball touches everybody's hands. Luca might have a couple of isolations. Jalen might get a couple of looks because Luca's getting doubled. Spencer come in and give a couple of points, and again, he's having a shitty series. But in general, when we're home, the offense flows. On the road, it's got to be Luka and Jalen. I, the, 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 I don't know why the playbook changes. I don't know why the, the offense changes. I don't know why Jason Kidd's met- methodology against or the plan against the Suns changes. If it ain't broke, don't fucking fix it. I, that saying goes and applies to everything in life. Why the hell do you change it now when we're away and we need to capitalize? I don't care if you're Luka Doncic. I don't care if you're Kevin Durant. I understand that the superstars got to get their shots. But when they're not efficient basketball shots, and Kyle can attest to this. I've said it while watching games on stream, like while recording, before recording, after recording. Luka may take a crazy shot and make it. That doesn't mean I like it. It's not a good basketball shot because what happens? We get so used to him making those crazy shots that when he misses, oh, it's not that big of a deal. No, it is. That's the problem. You're pulling from 25 feet because you feel that you can hit those shots confidently when there's 19 fucking seconds on the shot clock. Tell me on what planet and what other team that makes sense. We're down 10. You just pulled. You're bitching at the ref because you feel you got hit on the wrist. It's five on four going the other way. And you're still bitching at the ref when Phoenix scores. Tell me how that's a successful formula to win in, in any basketball team. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one of those things. When it comes to being in a deficit, Kevin, like, let's say, for example, if the Mavericks are down by 10, let's say there's seven minutes left in the third quarter. 
if you're coaching Dallas, what are you essentially running as far as the offense is concerned? What's your main objective? You're down by 10, well, seven minutes left in the third quarter. What are you trying no, to accomplish? Knowing that Luca doesn't really get a rest in the third until about two to th three to two to three minutes left, and then he rests until the fourth quarter, until a couple minutes in. In that situation, I already know Aiton's got a few fouls. I know that JaVel's got a few fouls. We have their third string center coming in. Dwight Powell's been inefficient, so I just gotta I gotta get Maxi Kleba involved. I gotta run pick and rolls, get my switches, beat him off the dribble, and kick out to my shooters. And if they're not open, I need you to take that person off because they're gonna close out and you need to attack the basket. Because Luca's gonna take the big away from the basket when he passes it away. I'm setting up screens and backdoor screens and pin downs for players that are just normally sitting isolated. People that are sitting around the perimeter, I'm creating space. I'm setting backdoor screens for others to get open baseline at the basket because the big has to come out and protect the exterior. He's got to protect. He's got to follow his man. I'm Luka Doncic. No one on the, the Suns can guard me. It's a fact. It's not confidence. It's not cockiness. It's just genuine. He's scoring 20-something a game for a reason or 30-something a game for a reason. Whether or not we're losing... It's the point. He can get a shot wherever he wants. If I'm Dallas, I'm taking advantage of those mismatches, but I'm going at them. If those bigs are in trouble, I'm going to get the backup big in trouble. If they're going to go small, I'm going to put my back to the basket. I'm not going to keep shooting like this unless you're legitimately wide the fuck open. I'm not shooting anything like that. Yeah. Luca with his, his back to the basket... Dream shake, fake, fade away. Dirk Nowitzki, I get it. It's it's nostalgic. As a Mavericks fan, it's it's awesome to see. Then you start looking at it like, bro, that shot isn't necessary. Like, what are you doing? It It's one of those things that if you're down against a team like Phoenix, I mean, Phoenix is the best team in the NBA. And they had the best record in the NBA for a reason this season. I mean, Monty Williams just won coach of the year for a reason. And this team plays extremely well. To me, if the Mavericks are in a situation where they're down by double digits or about to be down double digits, you have to slow the pace of the game down and you got to play a little bit more of a grimier and more of a gutter type of offense. And like you said, like you outlined, you have to attack the paint, attack the rim. And the thing is, granted, you may not knock down shots, but if you're able to get fouls, get to the free throw line, that's going to throw Phoenix off of their game because Phoenix, when they get into transition after a turnover, I mean, it's a nightmare defensively for Dallas. And especially if Phoenix is knocking down shots when Dallas isn't, you're not going to be able to stop an avalanche because that's what it's really kind of felt like in these third quarters for Dallas. It's just when, when Dallas goes cold, Phoenix just starts knocking down shots and Dallas's fallback option is to just keep on shooting and that hasn't worked. So when it comes to the situation, if Phoenix goes on a run, they got to slow the pace of the game down, attack the paint with whoever. It doesn't really matter. Get those bigs into trouble or get even Devin Booker and Chris Paul into foul trouble. I'm just saying, you have to make this a situation where you have to live at the free throw line, slow the pace of the game down, and put all of the pressure back on Phoenix just based off of personnel issues because guys are in foul trouble. If the Mavericks are able to do that, Right, that it may happen in game six. If they win, they would have to probably do that in game seven. But at this point, Jason Kidd's adjustment in the second half, because this is where they've particularly struggled in, they have to really play solid defense against Phoenix. And if Phoenix goes on a run, they got to make it a point of emphasis to attack the paint and stop living with these long twos and three-point shots. It's not a viable way to get back into the game against Phoenix. And I think the reason why is it's panic. They're panicking. They're trying to they're trying to catch up in a rapid amount of time. And sometimes that's not necessarily the best method to use. Sometimes if you're down by 10, 12, even 15 points, it may take you a quarter and a half to get back to a point where it's only a three or five point game. But if they panic and they try to get you know, the deficit down to three to five in like two to three minutes, it's not going to happen because more than likely what's going to happen is they're going to miss their shots and Phoenix is going to get open looks and Phoenix is going to extend the lead. That's exactly what happened in game, th game five.
So the one thing that I think Jason Kidd, and this is where I think the coaching aspect, I think this is kind of getting lost in this whole equation, is that Jason's got to essentially make the adjustment of, if we're down, let's not throw up panic shots. Slow the pace of the game down, go to the free throw line, and see if we can try to make it a more gutsy, more of a grittier type of game. Like, I'll give you an example. Milwaukee feasts on that method in the playoffs. There have been times where the Bucs look like... It, honestly, watching the Bucs in the playoffs sometimes, it hurts to watch because when they miss and the method of how they miss, it's just kind of ugly to watch. But when they play solid defense and they knock down their two-point shots and they're knocking down their free throws, it works. They're giving Boston a hell of a run. And Boston is one of the best defensive teams in the NBA. And Milwaukee is one game away from going to the Eastern Conference Finals. I'm telling you, Dallas can take a page out of Milwaukee's playbook in that regard when it just comes to really the method and style of how they play when they're down. Because I just don't think that Dallas really knows how to get out of a hole, especially in a playoff setting, especially on the road. Maybe at home it's one thing. But on the road, they, they have had no answer for Phoenix. Phoenix has dominated them by and large uh, on the road. And last, last number, nine assists last night. Phoenix had 28. We had 16 turnovers. Phoenix yeah. had 12. I mean, turnovers are going to happen. I mean, honestly, the, the turnover spread isn't as wide as I thought it would be, but the assists is where... Nine. I mean, it was are, all isolation basketball. That's all it was. That... that that tells me everything I need to know. And the thing is, the inefficiency from the field from Dallas was, I mean, when you're shooting in the 30s, Phoenix is basically shooting damn near 50% from the field. You're not going to win basketball games that way. Nope. There's no way. So, you know, we'll see how the series plays out. Um, you think that the series ends uh, in Dallas uh, in game six? You think it ends? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a score? No, like a, don't like really a, care like, for it. I ha, I don't I don't really have anything. I kind of I'm I'm gonna go with again similar to what happened last game. Um, just keep it close, gain some confidence, continue to shoot. Either Luca gets into his head, or you know Devin goes off again, or maybe even Chris Paul starts to pop off. Chris Paul's due for a big game. Hasn't had one in a few games. Uh, Devin Booker's basically been averaging thirty damn points throughout this series. Um, DeAndre Ayton is going to have a big game. I don't know. We just we haven't been able to figure out Ayton. We've been lucky that they haven't really abused us in the last couple of games because we've been playing such good defense. But this last game has been a little uh, was a little uh, on the flake thing for us or flake side. So yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think this is going to be possible. I'd rather just put it out of my misery and end it now than have to go to Game Seven and get embarrassed in one of the biggest Game Sevens in in, in Luca's career. Well, I mean, we'll we'll see how it plays out. On, on Thursday, I, it's still going to be an interesting game to watch. I'll definitely be paying attention to it, but um, watching. But we'll see. But with that said, we are going to transition to the Eastern Conference side of things, and we're going to focus on the Miami Heat and the Philadelphia 76ers series. So as it stands right now, the Heat are up three two in the series after a dominating Game Five performance. I think dominating was kind of an understatement. Miami won by thirty five points. They won by the score of one hundred twenty to eighty five. And th this was after Philadelphia made a pretty solid homestand in games three and four, winning both of those at home to tie the series at 2-2 apiece. But Miami really just put, they put their foot on the pedal in game five and didn't look back. I mean, they had a great performance from Jimmy Butler. Uh, Max Struess, kind of one of the, the biggest unsung heroes for Miami this entire season, really stepped up as well. And they've been getting good contributions from other players like Bam Adebayo, P.J. Tucker. Tyler Hero, and a couple of names that you could throw out there as well. But when you look at Philly, Philly's in a very desperate situation right now. Um, granted, Game 6 does go back to Philly, so they will be at home, and they've largely been successful at home this series against Miami. But when you're down 3-2, and how bad they got embarrassed in Game 5, kind of, it's kind of a tricky situation for, for Philly at this current moment in time. And that's really kind of where I'm going to pose the question to Kevin in this regard. So, Kevin, to kick this one to you, with Game 6 going back to Philly, do you think the 76ers have any shot to extend this series against the Heat to seven games? To be honest, bias aside for the James Harden hatred, I don't think so because 
the entire team shot inefficiently outside of Joel Embiid this game. Joel Embiid wasn't incorporated necessarily into the offense early enough, in my opinion, until the second half when it was too late. Philly is incapable of stopping a nosebleed from what I saw yesterday to where they were just giving up shots left and right. They were giving up layups. Miami was penetrating in the paint. Miami was getting good looks. I mean, you name it, they did it. I mean, the, the, even their bench came in and they got double-digit points and contributions from multiple people. I mean, we're talking about Oladipo got 13, Hero got 10, uh, Struess had 19, Gabe Vincent had 15. Like, it, it's kind of crazy. Like, Miami went off in all facets of the word. In Philadelphia, their big, I guess, three or four, depending on who you want to include in that, was just awful. James. Again, 5 of 13, 14 total points, 4 turnovers. Tyrese Maxey, the you know unsung hero for this postseason run that the Sixers have been on. 2 of 10, 9 points. He had 2 turnovers. Joel Embiid, 7 of 12, like I stated. He didn't really get incorporated until it was too late, but he ended with 17 points. And he did actually end up getting hit in the face where he fractured his orbital bone. So that is something to monitor. Um, the mask just wasn't enough. I believe him and Dwayne Dedman were going up for a ball, and Dedman hit the ball into his face. He ended up coming back into the game, but, you know, again, just something to monitor. Danny Green isn't necessarily known to be a, a prolific scorer. When he's hot, he's hot, but he only had six points. And then Tobias Harris, 5 of 14, 12 points. It's not enough. The Sixers had 15 turnovers. The Sixers actually shot arguably worse than the Mavericks. Except they made one more three, so probably not. So they shot 28% from three, 36% from the field, 93% from the, from the free throw line. Dude, the starters for Miami all went into double figures, including P.J. P.J. had 10. Jimmy had an incredible game with 23. Bam had 12. Vincent had 15. Struess had uh, 19. It's crazy, bro. It is absolutely insane. They were just shooting at such an efficient clip. 53.6% from the field. I watched this game. Miami was getting every look they wanted, and Philly just came out flat. I think Charles Barkley made a great point <clears throat> when he said that Joel came out and it looked to be distracted with the result of the MVP voting. And obviously, you know, congratulations to Nikola Jokic winning his second consecutive NBA MVP. Uh, we'll get into that in a moment also. But in general, I think it kind of affected Joel that he didn't win. I think he came out a little distracted, his head kind of in the clouds and things of that nature. Um, again, I could be wrong. I'm just giving my personal opinion because he just didn't really seem to demand the basketball when the game had started like he normally does. He didn't really have an aggressive presence. And then, of course, when the rest of the team is just completely shooting inefficiently and Miami is getting back in transition and scoring at the efficient clip that they were, I think it was going to be hard for anybody to get into a rhythm. So. Philly's in bad shape right now. Miami's riding a big high. They got that big win at home. They showed that their defense can get it done. Uh, Jimmy Butler stressed in the postgame press conference, even if they're not hitting those shots, if they just focus on defense, offense will come. Jimmy's always been that kind of player. And um, I think Miami moves on to the Eastern Conference Finals, man. I don't think Philly's going to be able to overcome um, this much of a stigma and this much of a fallout because it just didn't look good at all. And, I mean, I know we got embarrassed too, but – 35 points. We got embarrassed by 30. Uh, it, just, it just does not look good because Philly's got way more help than Dallas does, and they're still not going to be able to get enough to combat this strong number one seed in Miami Heat team. Well, I actually think that Philly has a decent shot of actually winning game six, and it's pretty simple. It's based off of those games, uh, the game three and game four performances that they had, because we, when you look at game three specifically, they held Miami to under 80 points. That was a defensive battle. And Philly just wiped the floor with Miami in that one. So I got to give Philly some uh, credit with that one. And in game four, that was the game where I think finally Philly saw a James Harden signing. Because up until this point, James Harden has been, I would say, subpar overall. I don't think James Harden has lived up to the expectation that I think the 76ers organization had when they brought him into the fold. And I think 76ers fans have been largely let down by. Uh, his presence so far. Not as much as what Ben Simmons did last year because that was to a whole nother level to the way that Ben uh, did the 76ers last year in the playoffs. But when you have James Harden really only have one good game this entire series and really this entire playoff stretch that they've been on, uh, th that's largely been disappointing, but they did get it from him in game four. And with this game going back to Philly for game six, 
there's a very good chance that they could actually win game six and force a game seven. And, and it's pretty simple. So when I look at Philly, right, so they got absolutely destroyed in games five. There's no other way to put it. When you get beat by 35 points on the road in a pivotal game five, it, it's embarrassing. It's one of those losses where you either bounce back saying that wasn't us, you know, that we put that in the rear view and then you just focus on the next game ahead of you and they could win that one by 15, 20 points. Or it could be one of those situations where maybe they just can't get the rhythm that they need or the consistency that they're looking for and they lose game six by 15, 20 points against Miami. I don't see that happening though. I do think that Philly is in a little bit of trouble after that game five performance, but not to the point where they're just done and it's over with. I think going into this game six, the one thing that I'm looking for is Joel Embiid and James Harden to show out. There have been times, there have been flashes where both these guys ha have been on point with their production, but I need to see more from James. James is really the key piece for Philly here. Granted, I understand that Tyrese Maxey and Tobias Harris have had their flash moments in this series, but James, they brought him here for a reason. They traded Ben Simmons away to bring in probably one of the most prolific scorers the NBA has in this generation with James Harden. And despite the fact that a lot of people were making comparisons about Joel Embiid and James Harden being very similar to Kobe and Shaq, which I thought was disrespectful that that comparison was even being made, it hasn't really worked out to the extent that a lot of people originally anticipated. But I do think that in this game six, I think both of them have great games. I think Joel is going to bring out essentially that MV type of the MVP type of performance where he's going to put up 30, 35 points. And I think James is going to chip in for a solid 25 piece. And then if they're able to get decent production from Tyrese Maxey and Tobias Harris, I'm not saying that they have to go out there and score 25, 30 points, but if they can get 15, maybe even 20 points, that puts Philly in the driver's seat to force Miami into a situation where the series goes back to game seven. And at that point, it's a toss up. You never know how those game sevens play out. It's a lot of pressure for both teams to get that. But this is one of those situations where I think Philly got so embarrassed in game six. They knew that that wasn't them. They got distracted maybe because of what Kevin was mentioning with uh, Joel Embiid not getting the MVP. And sometimes you get distracted and you just lose a game that way going into it. But I, I mean, I have to say Miami looks great in that game six. Um, they have looked like the better team overall in this series compared to the 76ers. But I'm not going to count out the 76ers. I mean, this they have a pretty solid lineup to work with here. When you have a lineup that consists of Joel Embiid, James Harden, Tyrese Maxey, and Tobias Harris, those are four studs to work with. And I think if they're able to get decent production from all of them, I could see Philly putting up at least 100, 110 points when it's all said and done. And I think in the end, I think Philly's defense is going to be good enough to get by Miami in this one and, and force a game seven. I, I think it's going to be a relatively close game. I don't see this one being like a blowout from either team. But I do think that the Sixers win this game six by maybe, I'm going to say somewhere between five to eight points. And I, I do think that Joel and James are going to be the biggest difference makers uh, in this game. And if you're a 76ers fan, you better hope that James Harden shows up. Because if he doesn't, really this season with James has been largely a disappointment. And, you know, hopefully for the 76ers fans, James shows up and gets them to a game seven. I mean, this has been a very compelling series. Um, even though that I said that Miami has been the better team this series, I'm not discounting what the 76ers have to offer. I do think that they have the pieces to force a game seven, and I do think that they will. So I'm going with the 76ers in game six, and it should be a fun finish uh, when this series uh, goes to game seven, if it does. But I'm basing it off of a game six win, really. That's just how I see it. I just find it funny, you know? Like, it's all this hype around James. We've warned multiple people that he just he's not that guy. He's never been that guy. He's a completely different player. Um, in the postseason, we've kind of made that comparison to the Clayton Kershaw thing for baseball players. Uh, for those of you that you know know about that situation, I don't care 
what it is he can bring to the table, the potential that he has, the the option that he can go for 30 at any given night. Has he, other than one game? No. Has he been able to do it efficiently without at least, you know, not turning the ball over? No. Has he been able to do it from a facilitation aspect? No. All of the reasons why you wanted to get James Harden and bring him to this team, he has not been willing or able to do any of those pieces. He's known for hitting big shots. He's known for getting to the free throw line. He's known for being a great uh, great passer. He's not doing any of that shit. I find it funny. Again, we've said it. I think that this is a neutral loss in terms of the trade since Ben didn't play and Philly's about to get waxed in the second round because James is not performing, like, at all. They're not moving on because James Harden is doing good. The only reason I would give Philly the edge is because James is on the court putting up, even if it is two points, it's two more points than Ben has had. What I'm saying is Philly's not getting the player that they expected. They can get 14 points from a bench player. They can get 14 points from two bench players. James, the guy that you're paying 30-some-odd million dollars for, the guy that wants an extension, the guy that demands he be the focal point of your offense when you have an MVP candidate like Joel Embiid that's already causing uh, turmoil within the locker room, as we've talked about, with Tyrese Maxey not wanting to even sit near him, taking shots away from Tobias Harris for him to get the narrative that he sucks. James is not the player we, he once was. And he has for sure lost a step. And once people start to accept that, I think that they'll understand where I'm coming from. Because granted, a lot of it is a little bit of a biased hatred or a little bit of a discomfort to how he managed a lot of his offseason situations. But him on the court has never been an appealing basketball player because I never appreciated his style of play. And now the world is starting to see. Yeah, and it's kind of been James's MO when it comes to the playoffs. During the regular season, James has been phenomenal in stretches. I mean, he had a great stretch with Houston where he was averaging in the 30s consistently. But when it comes to the playoffs, Kobe said it. That style of basketball, when it's, you know, one ball-dominant player essentially running the entire offense, the way that James ran it in Houston, and to a certain extent, the way that they're running it in Philly— James has largely struggled in that regard when it comes to these playoff situations because the way that defense is played during a regular season, it is not the same when it comes to these playoff situations. And James's overall efficiency has taken a hit in pretty much all of these playoff series that he's been in, whether it was with the Thunder early on in his career, whether it was with Houston and essentially the prime of his career. And even though that... I, Granted, I would say that James has taken a slight step back from where he was in Houston. He's still a very viable piece moving forward. It's just he hasn't been able to produce when it matters the most. And that just continues to be the trend. I mean, like you said, he's had one good game this series. That was in game four when he got 31. Outside of that, he's largely struggled. I think this is one of those situations, though, where I think Philly looks back at that game five. They just burned the tape. They knew that they weren't on that game in any way, shape, or form. And I think they just used that as fuel to get back in this game six and, and force the game seven. I think this is one of those situations where when you play that bad, it can't get any worse. So I think from this point forward, I think, you know, Philly has no choice but to go up after that game five loss. And I think it's enough to result in a game six win for Philly. But, you know, even though that I did pick Philly to win this game, it wouldn't surprise me if, if the Heat won. The Heat have been the better team. This series, uh, they've shown me more. They more they are a more well rounded unit than what Philly is. But I mean, even despite the fact that Joel is playing with a broken face, he's going out and there a torn and, ligament in his shooting hand in his thumb. He's, he's always going, playing through something. I love it. He's he's a warrior. He's going out there and giving Philly everything that he has. He's taking shots to the face and still going out there and playing. So. I, I do think that Philly will get it back in game six, though. That's I, I think that crowd is going to get behind them. I think they're going to be ready to go. And I wouldn't be surprised if this goes back to Miami for game seven. I really wouldn't. At that point, like I said, it's a toss-up. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. But with that said, we're going to transition to our next topic. We're going to focus on uh, some MLB discussions, and we're going to focus this one on the New York Yankees. We had a segment... Uh, just a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the Yankees and their hot start uh, was surprising to too many. Well, the Yankees have followed up 
that hot start with just utter dominance at this current moment in time. But granted, we're still uh, pretty early into the season. We're only about halfway through the month of May. But the Yankees hold the best record in baseball at this current moment in time. They are sitting at a 22-8 and record. Uh, they've done a pretty solid job against the Blue Jays within the last week and a half to two weeks. Won a away series against Toronto just a couple of weeks ago. And as of right now, they won the first two games of a three-game stretch against the Blue Jays at home. And when you look at the Yankees, there was a point in time for what? We're playing in Chicago tomorrow. Oh, well. It was just a two-game series. Got you. So, but despite that, overall, the Yankees have been really, they've been on a fantastic pace to start the year. Um, I know it's been very surprising, not only to Kevin, but I think it's been surprising to a lot of people because there was, I mean, I think we were saying that the Yankees were probably the fourth best team in the division going into the season alone. And they have proven a lot of people wrong, including Kevin and I both. And you know, I mean, Kevin's a diehard Yankee fan, so I'm going to kind of pose this one to him. So, Kevin, get this one to you. Just how impressive has this dominating start by the Yankees been to you? It's, it, to me, it's crazy. To me, it's something I didn't expect. To me, it is, it's more than a shock. I, dude, the, the offseason that we had, the lack of effort we made into key free agents, the signing of Donaldson or the trade for Donaldson, um, the lack of the ability to get Aaron Judge locked up, for uh, for the foreseeable future, um, re-signing Rizzo, everybody in New York was just like, "Are you kidding me?" We kept Boone. It was just a whole magilla of great. This is about to be a depressing season. Like I always tell Kyle jokingly, I love my Yankees. I'll die for my Yankees. But I was ready for them to break my heart again. And I understand it's still May, but we're twenty-two and eight. We are absolutely ripping the baseball. We're pitching crazy. We're we're just we're. we're we are absolutely dominating teams. I mean, I pulled up the scores for some of our last games. Bro, we're literally talking about annihilation, not only in hitting the baseball, but getting the baseball out. Just a couple of weeks ago, I think I want to say we, 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 were, we were scoring nine points against the Blue Jays. We scored 12 points against the Royals, 10 points against the Orioles, 12 points against the Orioles. We're finding ways to come back. Labor Torres has been really clutch. Aaron Judge had a massive walk-off for us the other night. Uh, it has been an incredible ride. And the pitching is holding, which is another thing that drives me nuts because we didn't do a damn thing for our pitching staff this offseason. Nestor Cortez has a 1.41 ERA and almost threw a no-hitter yesterday. Nestor Cortez has 42 strikeouts. Like, what the fuck is going on? Granted, he's only one and one because obviously decisions and whatnot, but holy shit. I, I am in awe. Our team ERA, including our bullpen, is a 259. What? I mean, Clay Holmes leads our team with four wins. Aroldis Chapman has not blown a save this season. Like, what are we talking about right now? It's just nuts. And the for the fact that we're sitting here and we're talking about the Yankees being in first place, we're talking about the Yankees having the best record in baseball. I really, I, I, I can't say anything, but holy shit, it's, it's absolutely insane. I'm happy with it. I mean, I'm... I'm just looking forward to seeing what happens as the season progresses. Can we keep it up? Are the bats going to continue to stay healthy? Um, will Aaron Judge get the extension that I think he deserves? Will Will, will DJ LeMahieu continue to hit consistently like he has been? I don't know. But we're doing it in all fronts. We're finding ways to come back. We're becoming one of those teams where you can't really rule us out. I mean, we're, we walked off on back-to-back -back days, one being, you know, Glaber today, and then, of course, uh, well, no, we didn't walk it off, but we came back. Uh, you know, Glaber puts us back in the lead, and we win 5-3. Judge hits a massive shot last night, and and that takes us out. And, God, that was a shot and a half. But overall, man, I, I, I cannot complain. I'm just, 
I have no words. Kyle knows whenever he sends me anything about the Yankees, either I've sent it to him or I'm in shock that I didn't send it to him because I don't believe that it happened. Like the Red Sox are one of the worst teams, if not the worst team in the division. My heart is just happy. I can't say anything else. You know, this is kind of one of those moments where it's a little bit odd for me because when Kevin, Kevin has a very good sense of just whenever there's a hint of ineptitude or a, a hint of inconsistency, Kevin's like the first one to pounce on it. He like He's like, this team sucks. It's like, they need to fix this. They need to fix this. They need to fix that. And, and to be quite honest with you, this is one of those very few times where Kevin is just over the moon with one of his teams that's actually playing really above and beyond at this current moment in time. And, and granted, I'm not a Yankees fan. Um, I mean, I follow the Yankees just to kind of keep up with Kev just a little bit. But, you know, just kind of looking from like a bigger perspective here, the start that the Yankees have had this year has been utterly phenomenal. And to me, it's been just unexpected because I just didn't see it happening. I mean, for God's sakes, I think Kevin and I, we were talking about were the Yankees the fourth best team in their own division behind, you know, in no specific order, Blue Jays, the Red Sox, and the Rays. I mean, there was a legitimate case that you could make going into this season with that, but the Yankees have just completely thrown that to the side with, with this start. I mean, with the way that they, the way that they're sitting right now, they have a 22 and 8 record. I mean, I wasn't expecting anything like this. I was maybe kind of expecting more of like a 500 type start from the Yankees. Um, they would, you know, have like a 14 and 14 record or like a 15 and 15 record at this current moment in time, not 22 and eight. And really the, the biggest thing that stood out to me this year with the Yankees so far has been their bats. The Yankees are hitting dingers and it's not just from one player specifically. It's really a, a group effort here because at the beginning of the year, Anthony Rizzo was really the tone setter for the team because Judge didn't necessarily have the best start. Stanton would have a good game here and there, but was inconsistent to a certain extent. But Rizzo was really the one that, that got this whole run party started with the Yankees. And then as, as time's gone on within the first month of the season, like Kevin had outlined, you know, Glaber Torres has really stepped up in like the last two weeks or so. He had a walk-off hit just not too long ago. He has a five RBI performance against the Blue Jays on Wednesday. And you know, to be able to essentially win both series against a team like the Toronto Blue Jays, the Toronto Blue Jays are one of the better teams in the American League, not just from, you know, specifically this year, but last year as well. Ke that was really Kevin's benchmark. Oh, if the Yankees were able to beat up a team like the Blue Jays, that would mean something significant to him. And they won these games in a pretty convincing fashion, except for one. So, you know, the way that I see it with the Yankees, it's still early. And, you know, I don't want to get too ahead of myself when it comes to how the Yankees have started this year. Granted, their start has been astounding this year. It's been unexpected. And I, honestly, I think it's great for baseball, the fact that the Yankees are doing so well. And I do think that as we continue down the stretch, I think throughout the month of May, I think the Yankees are going to continue this dominant play. Because they play against the White Sox in a three-game series starting on Friday, or excuse me, on Thursday. That's actually a four-game series, uh, not a three-game one. And then after that, they play the Orioles, they play the White Sox again, and then they finish out the month with a three-game series against the Orioles and then against the Rays before they kind of transition into June, where they'll start against the Angels. So I think there's a very good chance that the Yankees are going to be able to extend their, their lead in their own division in the AL East. And I do think that as long as the bats are there, the pitching is consistent, that, you know, the Yankees could essentially go throughout the entire month of, they, they can go through the month of May and still be the best team in baseball. Granted, you know, all those components that I mentioned, they still have to be consistent. But nobody could tell me and make me believe that the Yankees would be sitting at the best record in baseball about halfway through the month of May. I, I, I wouldn't have believed you. I thought that they would have been probably a, a average team at best. But with the way that they started, 
the way that they've been winning some of these games in, in dramatic fashion. Um, this is a t- this is a fun team to watch. Um, I'm not going to make a prediction that this team is instantly go to the World Series. It's way too early to make that prediction. But when you look at teams like the Yankees, you look like teams uh, like the Angels, for example. The Angels are having a very good season as well. Both of these teams, specifically with, with the Angels and Yankees, they're having great starts to the year. And um, it'll be interesting to see how, how both these teams played out. But to, to kind of just wrap this up, uh, the Yankee start has been utterly phenomenal. And there's really nothing else for me to say other than that. Yeah, no, Kyle and I brought up pretty much every point with them. And I mean, I don't want to dwell on it too much longer, especially because I don't want to come across too biased. I'm happy and I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, there are two things I wanted to touch on really quick to kind of segue back to the NBA, just because there there was a game that finished before we started recording. And there's a game currently going on where the result is absolutely astounding. Um, I'll start with that one. Memphis is up almost 40 points on Golden State. It is 92 to 56 in the middle of the third quarter. Obviously, we know that John ja Moran is out for the remainder of the playoffs. And I I don't even know what the hell is going on. I see that at halftime, Golden State had 14 turnovers. They have 15 right now. Um, it's not that they're not shooting at an efficient rate. Um, they're shooting 44% from the field and 37 from three. I think it's just the turnovers and the efficiency that Memphis is going at. Memphis is I, shooting at 48% from the three-point I, line. I, I have to make a point about this. Kevin... Be real with me for a second here. Has there been times when we've watched some of these games play out and you think that the league is... 100%. I'm going to make a point here. Before the uh, the Warriors and the Grizzlies game started, ESPN was kind of doing their pregame uh, lead up before the game. And they had a graphic going into a commercial break where it said, the Warriors were going to lead the series 3-2 to two before the game had even started. Now, I don't know if that was a typo. I don't know if it was just like the graphic w- was messed up. But it said that the Warriors were up 3-2, to two, not 3-1. And granted, I'm not going to you know make this whole conspiracy theory about, oh, ESPN already knows the result before the game played. But when the Warriors look like this, when they're losing by 40 points, that kind of raises an eyebrow with me. I, I, I'm not going to lie. When the graphic says the Warriors are up 3-2, to two, granted, it could just be a mistake on ESPN's part. They could have just screwed up the graphic. But we've watched some of these games. We've watched some of these referees make like atrocious foul calls throughout this playoff specifically. Oh, Memphis has been in the line 21 times already. Golden State's only been 8. And Memphis has been a really good team without John Morant this year. So I do have to make that point as well. 100%. But I find it kind of somewhat ironic that ESPN has a graphic up that says the Warriors are up 3-2. And then the Warriors are getting spanked by 40 points. 40. I find that a little ironic. It, it's it, it, it's just it's weird, and I'm not gonna sit here and say I've never said stuff like this before. And to Kyle's point, it's funny how Golden State kind of like annihilates Memphis the other game, and now magically they don't know how to play basketball and they lose by they're losing by 40 points. Like it's just like Clay has 19 and Steph's got 14. Steph's not having the greatest night; he's four of ten. But you know we we we've seen him find ways to turn it around, but. The biggest piece for me, Jordan Poole's got three points. What the fuck is that? Yeah. <laughs> they're mm-hmm. superstar. They're, they're spark. Andrew Wiggins, they're all-star. The all-star leading vote-getter in the Western Conference has five fucking points. What, the, what are we doing right now? I, I mean, I I, I, we've even said this before, though. <laughs> there are times where the Grizzlies may be a better team without John Morant. I mean, their, their season record with him on the bench when he was hurt. I mean, it was like outstanding. They they were like, like twenty two like and three or something like that. Yeah, they, they they were like above five hundred, and it wasn't even close with uh, John Morant not on the floor. So, I mean, good for Memphis. You know, I mean, they're down three one. They needed to make some sort of stand at home just to kind of save face. But, Kev, I. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
I'm agreeing I, with you, bro. I'm a, I'm with you. I, I I don't know. I I don't want to believe it's true, and it could just be a mistake on ESPN's part. But I just I, I find it a little odd that ESPN already had that graphic up and the game hadn't even been played. That that's a red flag for me. But it could have just been an anonymous mistake. So we'll kind of see. Now there was another game that you wanted to mention, and that was I think the um, the Celtics and, and Bucks game as well. Yep. Uh, so that was game six. Uh, excuse me, game five. So Milwaukee takes one in Boston at the end of the game and wins by 110 to 107. This comes down literally, literally all the way to the wire. Uh, Drew Holiday saves the day with two incredible defensive plays. He blocks Marcus Smart uh, when they have the final possession, and then he goes out and steals it from Marcus Smart in the next Boston possession. So Drew Holiday may not be the most efficient scorer. Drew Holiday may not be the prettiest offensive player, but we know why he gets paid $175 million, and that's because he's going out there and he's making defensive stops, and he's being a pest on defense like he's supposed to be. But there is more to the narrative here. Giannis goes for 40, but he has seven turnovers with 11 boards. And like I said, Drew Holiday goes 9 of 24, continuing his streaky offensive, whatever you want to call it. He also goes for 8 and 8, 24 points. Bobby Portis has his most inefficient night that I've seen in the postseason thus far. 4 of 14, 14 points, 15 boards. Absolutely incredible. And then you go and you flip it over to Boston, man. It's It's... It's the same tale that we tell you guys every week. It's Jason and Jalen. Jason goes for 40, excuse me, 34. Jalen goes for um, 26. They're doing everything that they can, but without the really help of the the supporting cast around them. Uh, you know, Grant Williams had zero. Al Horford had a bad night after having an incredible game four. He had eight points. Uh, Marcus Smart, with him having those final two turnovers, he had 15 points, but um, just, just was not enough for them to overcome the surging bucks. And now with the Bucks going back home for game six, um, it ain't looking good for Boston. I don't discount Boston to possibly win. No, that game no, no. Six, this so. is going seven games. You think so? I, I, I think it very well might. I think Boston's gonna make an adjustment. This wasn't a uh a lack of offense or a, a, a kind of lapse on the defensive side. I mean, from the most part, uh, I'm looking at this and I'm saying the Celtics shot fifty one percent from the field. The Bucks only shot forty three. This was more along the lines of Boston having some miscues late in the game to kind of yeah. give Milwaukee the opportunity. You clean up those miscues, this is a whole different game. Boston did what it needed to do, and they kept, you know, Giannis, Giannis, wow, Giannis Antetokounmpo in check for the most part. And, bro, they, they forced seven turnovers from him. I understand 40 points is big, but when you force seven, when you force seven turnovers on the league's best player, uh, that's a pretty good night defensively. Cool. Uh, you know, I, I get it. It's hard to stop him in general. They don't really have a formula for it, but seven turnovers. 40. Dude, seven 40. turnovers is massive. I don't okay. give a fuck. Bro, seven when Luke, is- when Luca okay. does it, I get mad. When Luca has 40, 10, and 11, and he'll have eight turnovers, are you kidding me? 40. 40 points. Bro, that's sloppy. What if, the, dude, they, lost, they won by three. That turnover could have led to a tie. Two of those turnovers could have led to six points. Dude, turnovers are huge, like massive. He led the team by tenfold in the turnover I category. I understand. He also led. The he team was points, only though. plus. He was only a plus seven in the plus minus, and he had forty. That's not good. I mean, hell, Kobe could have put up 45 and had a negative first plus minus. I mean, I, honestly, you could make that point. But, I, I mean, still, like, you could say all you want about, like, the defensive, like, effort that, that Boston had. But, Kev, we talked about this before. They have nobody to match up against Giannis. Not one-on-one. No they one have, does. They, they don't have a body to go up against him. 40 points. I mean, we were uh, – people were giving praise to Andre Iguodala for – Keeping LeBron James in the NBA Finals like thirty six nine and like or like fifteen and nine, like Andre Iguodala won an MVP like Finals MVP off of that. So did Kawhi. Like LeBron got thirty six thirteen and nine, I think. Like what? Giannis drops forty points. Granted, he had seven turnovers. Forty. 
on the road in a pivotal game five. It's got to come for something, bro. Come on. I think I it understand. I under, I, I'm, I'm I, not I, saying I, it doesn't. I understand. I understand the turnovers. I get it. It's not a good look. But 40. Come on, bro. Cap it. All I'm saying is Boston did a good enough job to where they put themselves in a position where they could win despite Giannis's 40. It's fair. And they did not capitalize. But again, a good defensive game as a whole, considering he was the only one that really popped off. Yeah, which is true. I, I will say, though, with Boston, your last two possessions, the ball's in Marcus Smart's hand. That is not, that's not ideal. And the thing that's is, kudos, though. That's kudos to Milwaukee. They were denying they, Jason the ball multiple not, times. Not, not on that last possession, though. That last possession. I mean, if you watch the play with like the last couple seconds before Drew steals the ball, I mean, Marcus bobbles the ball and he's trying to regain possession of it. And that's when Drew strips him. If Marcus sees Jalen on the right side of the court, he is wide open. Wide open. I mean, that's an open knockdown three to tie the game potentially and to possibly send it to overtime. And two turnovers on back-to-back -back possessions by Marcus Smart. That's a tough one for Boston to swallow. That is, that's not an easy one to look back on. Because, I mean, you got Jalen and Jason. Those are your two best players. They don't get the ball. Granted, I will give a point to what you said about Milwaukee. Like, they forced Boston into that situation by getting Marcus the ball. By keeping out of Jalen and Jason's hands. Which is, you know, kudos on them. But man, that last possession, bro. That ball's got to be in hand or Jalen's hand and that there's a there's going to be a still image of Marcus Smart getting the ball turned over by Drew Holiday and they're going to see Jason wide open it's like that's a difference right there I mean literally it could have made the difference but we, I mean game six is going to be fun this series has been very competitive Ooh, it's going to be awesome I wouldn't be surprised if Boston wins it in Milwaukee they proved it in game four they could certainly do it again but Bro, I, I'm going to kind of be bold here. I think Giannis goes for 45. I think Giannis is going oh, big on this it's one. Not a, it's not a bold statement. I mean, we all know that in closeout games like the NBA Finals last year, he steps up in the most important plays. So. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes to the free throw line 20 times. I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever. He lives at the free throw line. I mean, he, he does a great job of, of getting Boston's defenders in foul trouble and making them pay for it. Granted, you know, Giannis is not like a 95% free throw shooter. But if he could knock down 70, 75% of his free throws, that's enough to work with. Especially if you're getting 20 free throws a game. You knock down at least 13, 14, or 15 free throws. I mean, those are easy buckets right there. That could be the difference. That's the way that Milwaukee plays. Milwaukee plays a very gutter, kind of a tough-to-watch type of offensive basketball in the playoffs, but it works to their benefit, so... I mean, we'll see what happens. Should be a very fun and compelling game six, but I think that place takes does that take place on Friday or Saturday? Friday. Okay. I remember they had they had like a three day stretch. There were no games. Everything's been one day off, one day on yeah, lately. They, it hasn't they, yeah. Yeah, they had one stretch though where they had three days off. That's neither here nor there. We'll tra transition to our next segment. So um you have one football segment to go over. Um Talk about the GOAT here for a minute. Um, Tom Brady, still currently playing uh, in the NFL with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, he has agreed to a contract with Fox Sports. So uh, after Tom Brady finishes his NFL career, uh, after he retires, he will become the lead NFL analyst for Fox Sports. He signed a 10-year, I think it was like a $375 million contract with Fox yep. Sports. I mean, an absolutely insane contract um I mean, for a 10-year deal that's substantial i think he would be the highest paid broadcaster um in any sport moving forward with yep. that type of contract so you know tom brady secures the bag uh his post-playing career he's still making um a boatload of money going into this year um we I mean, granted you know he i mean i think it's kind of safe to say he's going to have a phenomenal year going this year with the Bucks, with the roster that they have assembled, but knowing that he has his uh, his post playing career, 
uh, set in stone. Um, it's going to be very uh, reassuring and uh, comforting for him for at least the next decade or so. Now, Kevin, to kick this one to you, uh, what do you make of this contract that Tom Brady secured with Fox Sports that's up to $375 million over 10 years? I mean, I, th I think it's good for him. I think it goes to show, you know, there's life after football. I think it goes to show that, you know, Tom Brady knew that there was going to be something after football, especially financially, because he was, let's just be frank, he's the guy that always took all the pay cuts and didn't really get paid the majority of his career until he went to Tampa. And even at that, he's been taking pay cuts for the last season or two. So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you got to always look and plan ahead. Tom knew that once Troy and, and, and Buck Showalter all left, to go to ESPN, that there was going to be a vacant slot. I'm sure he was probably in communications Joe with Buck, multitude not, of networks. Joe Buck, not Buck Showalter. Excuse me. Sorry. Joe Buck. I knew it had Buck in it. I'm retarded. Um, what I'm getting at is Tom Brady's no idiot. Tom Brady's no dumbass. And for him to go out there and secure $37.5 million over the next 10 years when he does decide to retire is incredible. He's going to earn more from Fox in 10 years than he did in his entire NFL playing career. I think, Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, it was $333, $333 million in his career earnings as a football player, but they're going to pay three seventy five over the over a 10-year span as a broadcaster, right? Sir? It's nuts. I mean, they call him the GOAT not just because of what he does in the field. They call him the GOAT because he's actually able to pull shit off that no one's ever heard of. I mean, we all thought that Tony Romo was getting a massive bag from CBS. He's only making 18. Believe it or not, the second place person or the second place broadcaster getting paid right behind Tom Brady is Jim Rome at $30 million a year. I didn't even know Jim Rome was still out there, to be honest with you. Personally, I, I just I didn't know he was even getting paid that much if he was. Getting, over, getting overpaid, bro. It, uh, Stephen A. Smith makes $10 million, for those of you that don't know who Jim Rome is. So again, look at the look at the gap in this particular situation. Like, granted, Tom Brady's intelligence has got to be better than Tony Romo's, but Tony's just able to call the game so efficiently, even though he gets kind of annoying with how he's able to predict formations and sets. Overall, I'm excited to see what Tom Brady's going to be able to bring to the table from the broadcasting perspective. But this is incredible. Way to break the freaking ceiling on 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 broadcasting payouts way to go out there and show that athletes can be more than just athletes you can go out there and and, and do something that you love while still being incorporated into the sport i i think it's amazing yeah well, he's the goat bro <laughs> it's why he's the goat i know it makes give, Kevin so irritated bits, just just little bits of credit and you have to just take it to a step where you piss me off I, that's my job, bro. If I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job. It's that simple. Come on, you should know this by now. But listen, my guy we're talking about here, I mean, Kev, we've been talking about this man for over 20 years now. And now he's going to be doing it in the broadcasting booth when it's all said and done, too. And you know what? You, you get to see him every Sunday for the next 10 years. What's I'm again? just going to boycott Fox. I'm just going to turn you to CBS. And I'm going to be tuning in every Sunday just for Tom. After he retires, but um, I, I don't really have much to say uh, about this other than, you know, it, it's great for Tom Brady to secure a contract like this. Like Kevin said, I mean, breaking the bank when it comes to broadcasting, I mean, this is unprecedented. I mean, Kevin brought up Stephen A. Smith. I mean, for God's sakes, ESPN has Stephen A. Smith literally probably working 15, 16 hour shifts. And he's barely, I think, making, what is he making? Like just over like $10 million a year? Just from what I saw, the metric was 10. Yeah, and Jim Rome is getting paid 30. 30. Th for what? For what? If anybody's being overpaid, it's him. Because Jim I Rome is burning. I'll never forget that segment at like 3.30 on ESPN, like when we were younger. Yeah, yeah like, I, like I remember like he, like he had that slot with ESPN back in the day. But I mean, I mean, whoever his agent is, I mean, good on him for getting him that type of contract. But it's like... When has Jim Rome really been relevant on CBS? I mean, I don't really make it a point of emphasis to like search for Jim Rome's takes. Not because, at all. You know, just, I guess kind of out of the, the, the public circle, I guess. But CBS, I mean, good, that, good for him to get that contract. But I mean, with Tom, you know, th this is great for him for his post-playing post career. Um, you know, he's still going to be playing for, with the Bucks this year. I don't know if he's going to continue to play after this season. But, you know, to have this security set up, 
after his NFL career will come to an end. Uh, that's going to be very reassuring for him, his family. And um, I know that, you know, Tom just enjoys the game. Um, and even though that he's going to be in the broadcasting booth uh, when it comes to being with Fox after his playing career is over, I still think he's going to have the itch to go back out there and play. It wouldn't surprise if he drops like a little bomb here and there saying like, I can go out there and play guys right now. Like, I would just love for him to say that when he's in the broadcasting booth, just say like, yeah, these guys suck. Like, I know I could go out there and do way better than that. And I'm like, damn near 50. Like, I would just love it. So, um, you know, good for Tom. Um, it should be fun to see uh, what he brings to the table with Fox. And, um, you know, Fox really needed to do something big, though, because once they lost Joe Buck and Troy Aikman, I mean, that's a pretty big uh, vacancy to fill. But they're on their way to, to fixing this with Tom. I, that's, a, that's a massive step. And uh, I think he's going to be worth every penny that they give him. Good for Tom and good for Fox for being able to uh, sort this out. And now we are going to wrap up the episode with something that we don't typically do that often. And that is a movie review of the new Doctor Strange movie. So the new Doctor Strange movie named Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness. Or is it Madness of Multiverse? Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Listen, this is a tough one for me, okay? But uh, overall, um, what we're going to do with this is pretty simple. So you know, I'll pose the question to Kev. Uh, Kev will have his take on the movie. And then pretty much similar to what we do with our sports segments, get back to me. And then we'll pretty much just wrap up uh, the movie review uh, after that. So, Kevin, to kick this one to you, what's your overall take of the new Doctor Strange movie that came out last week? Well, if I have to be honest, um, it was a movie that caught me off guard. It was a movie that, you know, I wasn't necessarily expecting it to go in the direction that it did, even though Sam Raimi, the director, kind of insinuated it was going to go down a a darker path, a little bit more on the, you know, hor horrific background. Um, you know, I'm not trying to give any spoilers. In my personal opinion, I'd probably rate it an 8 out of 10. Uh, I would say that the characters that were introduced, the character development that was introduced, um, you know, the, the, the main protagonist and antagonist, while at the same time creating comic book accuracy storylines, was very well done. I think that the the development of Doctor Strange and America Chavez, and again, if those of you that don't know who these characters are, um, it's been out for a couple of days now, so I'm doing my best not to spoil anything. Um, the plot was great. Uh, the villain, or like I said, the antagonist was absolutely incredible. And I thought that everything that was discussed while uh, trying to maintain the integrity of what it is the multiverse is for me as a comic book fan was just very thought out. And I thought that it was you know done in a very efficient way without kind of like dramatizing how to go and bring in other characters it made perfect sense um i thought that you know the villain was very well explained within the reasoning as to why they are the way that they are and just so much was just expressed and explained in this movie to kind of put phase four on the map and then future phases within marvel to kind of make everybody just understand in the direction that they're going so you know dr strange has always been one of those avengers that you're always kind of like well what the hell does he even do other than magic? Um, there's a lot of stuff that people don't understand the relevance and importance of his role in the Avengers or just in Mar the Marvel Cinematic Universe as he is the mythological protector of the multiverse. He is somebody that kind of just guides all magic to make sure that it is, I don't know, protected right. It's, you know, people are in the, what people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. People aren't acting up or, you know, going out of control with powers or other magic. And I just, I really, really appreciated the direction that Sam Raimi went in. I think that that darker aspect of the movie was needed. I think that that pers persona of that villain was very well drawn up in a way that people can appreciate while at the same time understand, like, damn, this was a very different pace that Marvel went with, but it was a pace that I felt was just needed. And um, I felt that Things were explained very well, and I, I was very happy with it, and I look forward to future projects, and hopefully Sam Raimi can come back and you know film a couple of more Marvel movies, and if he gets lucky, if we get lucky, maybe we do Spider-Man 4, but The Multiverse of Madness, definitely an incredible movie, um, and I think that Sam Raimi deserves a whole lot of credit for what he's been able to do. 
Kev, I, I have a pretty similar sentiment when it comes to this uh, new Doctor Strange movie. Um, I thought the first Doctor Strange movie that came out just a couple years ago, I thought it was uh, largely successful. It was, it kind of lived up to the uh, the persona of Doctor Strange. It's a very kind of strange kind of like, it's a different type of superhero movie just based on really just kind of like the mystical and the magical arts that it presents with that character. And I thought they pulled it off very well uh, in the Doctor Strange movie that came out a couple years ago. And I think they did a, a pretty solid job uh, once again with this one. And, and like you said, with, with Sam Raimi coming into the fold, uh, with this being his first Marvel uh, produced movie, I thought the way in the direction that he went with this movie, I thought it worked out very well. Now, before I really kind of dive into like my analysis, I'm looking at this from a standalone movie perspective not kind of like looking at this from like where like Marvel has kind of led up to this point, like all of like the background, because I know there's been a lot of background lead up specifically uh, in regards to Wanda because really a large portion of this film is kind of, it kind of circulates around Wanda's uh, role. And I'll, I'll dive into that into a second, but this is primarily just going to be like, from my perspective as just a standalone film review. So, the thing that I liked about there's a couple of things that I like about this movie. First of all, um, I like the fact that to me, the pacing of this movie I thought was actually really well, because the one thing that I think Marvel movies have done in the past, when it comes to the individual superhero movies, they don't really hold a lot of weight as far as just the individual movie itself, because when it comes down to Marvel. Really, it's all based on the lead up to Avengers movies. And usually the way that I've always seen it is the better movies that come from Marvel are mostly the Avengers movies. Now, granted, you can make specific points about maybe like some of the Spider-Man movies that have come out that, that are pretty good. You can maybe make the case that um that some of the Captain America movies are pretty good. Like one like my particular favorites is probably like yeah, the Captain America Civil War. I thought that was actually a pretty good film as a standalone film uh, for Captain America. And I think in, in this specific instance, I thought that Doctor Strange uh, in the Multiverse of Madness, I thought that this was a, a pretty solid film from beginning to end. And I think the route that Sam Raimi went with this film, I thought was kind of accurate based on what they did with Wanda. And... The thing that was kind of interesting about Wanda is they did a very good job in explaining the motivation behind what uh, Wanda was doing in the first place. And it really has to do with just like her perception of an alternate universe where she's with her children and she just enjoys their presence, but it's not her actual universe it's in an alternate universe and she's trying to essentially live in that type of universe trying to focus on these dark arts that she was very focused on in the movie i'm not going to go too into depth i was about to say let's not spoil it for those people you know i don't i don't give a fuck it's hey, hey, wow, they wow, go, wow! They can go. They can go watch this movie. It doesn't bother me whatsoever. Damn it, man! Is it, it, we're, no. you know, people are going to click on it if they're spoilers. I, I don't care. <laughs> I'm like, I'm making my points. But overall, like, I, I thought they did a very good job in how they built Wanda. They actually made her a very good uh, antagonist, and I thought the way that she kind of carried herself, she was very dark in this movie, and the way that she was able to handle whatever sort of foes that she went up against. I mean, she was a savage. And it took Doctor Strange, kind of took him to bend the rules a little bit when it comes to you know, the mystical arts that he kind of holds himself to. And um, it was quite a battle between uh, Doctor Strange and Wanda, you know, at the end of the movie. Um, you know, like, like I said, I thought, the, I thought the pacing was very good in this movie. Um, I, I thought really, you know, Wanda was really kind of a big standout from this movie. I, I thought Doctor Strange uh, as just an individual character in this movie um, took some chances. And, uh, you know, it, it got a little bit dark, like, like Kevin alluded. This was kind of more of a darker 
uh, movie just based on the fact of really kind of the dark art aspect of this movie uh, that Wanda was really pursuing to kind of achieve, you know, being able to be with her kids in this alternate universe. And it, it kind of gave me like a little bit of an Inception vibe uh, just based off of like what was done in that movie where it's like there's a there's a specific scene in Inception where there are people that go to this, I guess, this this office or whatever. And their dream state is what they actually want. Like, that's the life that they really live. But their actual life is kind of a nightmare. And that's what it kind of gave me. Uh, it gave me a very similar uh, type of feel when it came to Wanda in this movie. Now, I do have some criticisms with this movie. And, and Kevin, you, you, you may understand where I'm coming from with this. I think the one thing that right, this is a superhero movie so you know take it with a grain of salt i think the over reliance of cgi is is becoming an issue because i understand there's there's a time in a, in a place when it comes to you know using cgi i think there are points in time where the where a lot of these superhero movies are too reliant on cgi because just some of the shots granted you know i mean you know the imagery that they present with the CGI, I mean, it's it's great. But you could just tell, like, it, it, it's missing th that sort of depth that past superhero movies used to have. And I know this is kind of like a different type of uh, movie because um, there are points in time where you're, you're kind of traveling into different universes and they have different looks. And I understand, you know, the imagery associ associated with that. It requires CGI. But it comes at a cost. Like there have been a lot of superhero movies that I've looked in the past. You could look at like, at some of the Batman movies that have come out. You could say, granted that's DC, but you know, you could look at like Batman Begins, um, the Dark Knight. They used actual city sets where it was actually shot in a city. Most of Doctor Strange is shot in a studio. It's pretty much, it's predominantly CGI. And I think that's one thing that kind of detracts from this movie. Granted, the imagery is fine. It just misses that the depth when it comes to the actual setting that they're portraying. Now, like I said, it, it's a superhero movie, so you know you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. But I mean, that's everything I have. I'm just happy to get behind the mic. Um, as you guys can tell, I'm, I'm still fighting whatever the hell I got going on internally, so... Definitely just happy that I'm I'm able to record. We're able to get something out there for you. We got plenty of stuff to chop up. Hopefully, we're able to get a couple of TikToks going. Um, we've been quiet on the social media pages for a little bit. I mean, if you guys are following the Twitter, um, that's always active. That's probably our most active social media scene. But, you know, we're just going to keep working at it like we always have been. We're sorry for the inconsistent scheduling between Kyle's vacation, my vacation, me getting sick, and all these different things that are just kind of happening. It's, it's life. We know it's not going to be perfect especially with our work schedules but we try to do the best that we can to kind of like you know make these segments make this material and content for you so uh, hopefully you guys are appreciative and if as always if you like what you see like the video kind of throw us and help us in the algorithm and if not uh subscribe to us if you would like to just kind of help us out whatever it is you guys want to do we just appreciate any feedback we can get from you guys yeah and as always uh, we appreciate the support wherever we can get it whether it's from the youtube side of things or if it's on the audio platforms like Spotify or Apple Podcasts, we definitely appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, we're basically reaching the point where we're at the end of the second round series in the NBA playoffs at this moment in time. Um, so when we record our next episode, uh, most of those series should have ended by then, and we'll probably be getting into the Eastern and Western Conference Finals uh, in the NBA. So that'll definitely be fun to discuss when we reach that point. And then if there's any sort of news that, that pops up that uh, peaks our interests uh we will definitely discuss it um Kev, I, I got nothing more to say um i think i've uh i think i've said enough uh based on that uh that movie review so i'll let you uh carry it home from here all right well guys as always thank you for everything we'll be seeing you guys hopefully again soon i know that this is going to be a, a day early or so but the mavs play tomorrow night as per usual with the playoffs as long as the mavericks are in i got to be able to watch it even if it's embarrassing so 
Eh, if we lose tomorrow night, at least we'll be able to go back to our normal scheduled programming Sunday nights and Thursday nights. But uh, we'll kind of keep you guys abreast and updated with all of that. But with all that being said, guys, have a great night. Um, hope you, hopefully by the time you guys hear this, you're having a great day at work or on your way to work or on your way home. But we, we'll talk to you guys soon. All right. We'll see you guys later.